questions? No questions? Homework was too easy? Have a quick look at the homework here to see if there really should be no questions. So someone asked the question for part C and they said, and the question was, how am I supposed to implement the mystery grid? Yeah, the answer is you don't because it's been supplied by yours truly. Um, it's right here. So you don't have to implement this at all. If you feel like it, you can look at it, um, but you shouldn't have to look at it um, unless things start going wrong. So your job is to implement what? Is to implement this, this class grids here with, oh, is that right? Yeah, I guess that is your job, yeah. And then I'm using it, right? I'm using it in the Game of Life viewer. Um, yes, so you implement grids. And so the difference between grids in number 12 and number 13 is that now, instead of being given a two-dimensional array, you're being given a grid, and you don't know what it is. You think you know what it is. You think it's going to be the mystery grid. But actually, nothing stops me in the final grading to submit uh, a different job where it's yet another grid, the Enigma grid, or some such thing. A three-dimensional. No, it can't be a three-dimensional grid because it has two-dimensional locations. So you don't know what it is, and that's OK. You just need to work with whatever grid was handed to you. All you know is its methods and you call those methods. Yes? <laughs> so, so now your question is, what if you want to have a grid that holds doubles? Yeah, and it, but it's like, but all the methods are inside the uh, Yeah, OK. So if for whatever reason I wanted that, that I wanted to have a grid that can hold other kinds of things, um, th that really is an interesting question. Um, I have two different choices. I could make the grid hold arbitrary objects. And then it would be up to the user to put in the objects. And then when taking them out, maybe they have to ca cast them to the specific type. Um, and that would be an easy way of doing it. The other way of doing it would be to define a grid that works with angle brackets so that I could say grid integer that has a type parameter. That's not something that we've covered yet, and you're going to see that, I believe, in CS 151. OK, well, some, some of you will see it in CS 151. Or you can simply look up in any you know, advanced Java book on how to do generic types. Um, but it's, it's a little bit more complicated, and so we can't cover everything in, in one course. OK, other questions about the homework? Uh, yes? Uh, for homework, uh, for C, yeah? Do we really have to have a constructor because it's not Ah, for, for B, do you have to have a constructor? And I think the answer is yes, because um, let me get some paper. Because what, um, the, your data structure is going to be these two parallel arrays. Um, so you have locations. And then you have this other parallel array of values. And how are you going to, where are you going to build those parallel arrays? I mean, you, or I guess parallel array lists, right? You have to construct them somewhere. Ah, okay, that is a good question. So um, 
let me get a blue jay and, and show that so that everyone knows what I'm talking about, or uh, what he's talking about. This is 13B, right? Unbounded grid, okay. <laughs> I don't think I'm giving anything away at this point by saying it has to implement grid. And then We have these two uh, parallel arrays, and so what I thought what you do is in the constructor um, that you would now hook up the actual <coughs> locations, thanks, and values. So that was what I thought you were going to do in the constructor. Of course, you do have to do it somewhere. Now, what, what he points out is you don't strictly have to do it in the constructor. You could do it here. And then you wouldn't need a constructor. And that's true, but the textbook never talked about it. And, or maybe in some special topic somewhere. So we've always written the constructors the other way. And so I figured that that's what you would naturally do. Um, and there's really no, I mean, the advantage of doing it this way, it's uniform. It's always the same way. And the constructor's job is always to initialize all of the instance variables. I have no strong feelings one way or another. If you prefer the other way, because it's let fewer keystrokes, you know, go for it. And no one's going to uh, really care. But what goes on under the hood is it makes the exact same constructor. So one way or another, you really are writing a constructor you're just maybe writing it in a more invisible way with fewer keystrokes. Um, and that reminds me of, uh, there was a post where someone said, what's the deal with this, this thingy here? It doesn't compile for me. And so if you're using Java 6, then the shortcut does not compile. This was a feature that was added in Java 7 where it says that if the compiler can figure out what the type is that should go in here, then as of Java 7, it will do so. So it'll put in the location. If you're still using Java 6, then you need to put in the location here. Or even better, you should ditch your Java 6 and install Java 7. Now I realize no one wants to mess with their configuration a, uh, a week before, two weeks before the final. So maybe you want to do that after the final. But um, then there may be a problem like that in the final where just without thinking I put in the, en the empty brackets then you just, as a Java 6 user, would have to have the, the wherewithal to put those back in. So when you turn in your homework with those things in there, it's of course perfectly correct. Um, and on <coughs> it's just that nowadays, as people get more used to these shortcuts, you know, people use it more often. I'm completely neutral on what, whether you should use it or not. It's just that I find myself using it without much thinking. And uh, Java 6 is no longer being maintained very much, so, so you really should be switching. Any other questions about the homework? Um, yes. So in the, in the homework, we're, we're supposed to be implementing the interface, which we're pretty much just copying the methods over. Yes, and that is, in fact, exactly what I, would, what, what I always do. And let me uh, do that and show one thing, and then I'll take your question. Okay. Um, so oh, that was actually nice of me. Um, I'll So here I'm going to copy and paste these things. And notice that just, 
just by dumb luck that these things were all declared as public. Strictly speaking, it's not necessary in, in an interface to declare them as public. And, but in the implementation, you always have to add in the public for an esoteric reason. Um, and I used to kind of say, well, the Java language says you shouldn't put it in the interface, but you can put it in the interface. And I guess I must have just, just automatically done it. Half the time, uh, if it's not in the interface, I forget in the copy and paste part to put it in. But so we're safe. It's in there. So yes, yeah, so now I've pasted them in here. And now what's your question? Yeah, in, in 13A, you do it for the rectangular grid. Right, and, then, and in 13B, you do the same thing yeah. for the unbounded grid. And you'll notice that the implementations are completely different. That the method headers are the same, but the way in which you implement them have nothing to do with each other. Like, for example, I'll give you for free occupied locations. So... In the unbounded case, that's the implementation. It's trivial because I happen to have the, the non-zero locations. In the bounded, in the rectangular case, I had to make it a sweep through the rows and columns of the grid to find all of the non-empty locations. So in, in real, I mean, in a, in a situation, we now we have unbounded grid and grid with specific implementation. No, no, you don't have grid. Grid is the interface. You have you have an unbounded grid and you have a rectangular grid. Oh, I mean rectangular grid, I'm sorry. Rectangular yeah. grid and unbounded grid with, with methods that are implemented differently. Uh -huh. and then how, so now we can use those methods in another class or? So yeah, and that one I think um, the 13C shows that uh, pretty well. So if we look at 13C, here we have our grid, we have uh, we have an actual implementation. And here we have the game of life viewer. And so let's look at the computation of the next generation. It's being given a grid. We have no idea what grid it is in this method here. And then we call some of these grids methods. And we just pass that grid to them and say, make this up. like here, set location. You know, set, set all these to, dead, to zero, set all these to one. And we don't actually know what the grid is. It's some grid. And we call methods on it. Um, and where does one decide which grid it is? That is somewhere in the constructor. Let me find that. Main, 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 main. I see. It's an init. And that is here. So over here, I happen to instantiate that with a mystery grid. I could equally well have said, new rectangular grid or new unbounded grid. And in fact, just for fun, try that out at home and put in an unbounded grid. And what you should be seeing is that the glider, instead of right now with the mystery grid, if you run it, it'll wrap around. That's how that, what that grid happens to do. So when the glider goes into one corner, it comes back out at the opposite corner. Uh, but if you try it in the unbounded grid, it'll just run away over the edge. So you definitely give that a try to see that you can substitute. Now you have you know, three different grids to choose from. You can plug any one of them in here simply by changing this one line of code. And that's the beauty of using the interfaces, that you only, when you want to make a decision which of these various ones to use, you only have to change it at a single spot. Everything else runs by itself on autopilot. So you can call all these methods without having to know what exactly the implementation is. You could add more methods if you wanted to. That's not something you would normally do because the, <clears throat> the rule is that it's always best for the user to just use the interface so that if they later want to change the implementation, they're not, uh, <clears throat> they're not restricted. And so, <clears throat> so once you have the interface over here, of course, the only method that you can call are the ones that are in the interface. So the only reason that people might add extra methods if they were helper methods. 
that you know, if, the, if a particular method was complex to implement and you would want to break it down into multiple methods, and then you might declare some of the others as private just to make sure that the reader understands they're not there for, for general consumption, but as helper methods. Other questions? <laughs> Okay, so there's one thing th that I had, we had a bit of grief with this assignment, and that was in count non-zero neighbors. So let's look at how that, uh, how that works. Let's get some scratch paper here. Well, I don't know what grid I'm getting, right? So, so I'm, I'm asked to count non-zero neighbors I get a grid, and I get a location. So here I have my location. Um, no, actually, that one is still, I think that one is still OK. So what do I know about a grid? A grid has four methods. Let me find those four methods here, because I can't remember them. So um, the methods are occupied locations, valid neighbors, and get and set. <coughs> so now I want to find how many non-zero neighbors there are. Um, okay, so that one actually is, is not hard. I've, I now need to call valid neighbors. And valid neighbors gives me some number of neighbors. You know, that might just be these ones, if it was sitting on an edge somewhere. What do I know? Some, some, some number of neighbors. And now I, all I have to do is I have to ask each of the neighbor, is it zero? And I do that for all of them, and I count how many. So that one I can do by just calling uh, valid neighbors. So let's look at the next method and see if that was the one that I struggled with. Um, It returned an array list. Yeah, and then I iterate through that. So I mean, I assume that, that you can that you can iterate through an array list, right? So you just say for location lock colon grid valid neighbors. Uh, I guess I can't call both lock. Um, and then you do something with L. And like you check, and I guess now you call get, right? Grid.get of L, and then you do some, and you check whether that's zero. So that one you can do without exactly knowing anything about the grid. Um, let's look at the next one. Um, I need 13C. Locations with, yeah, locations with a specific neighbor count. All right, so now I'm supposed to find all of the locations that have three neighbors. I'm just picking three as, as something random. So that was easy enough in the rectangular grid because what I did is I simply went through every single location that there was and say, do you have three neighbors? Do you have three neighbors? Do you have three neighbors? And I did that you know, going through all of the rows and columns. And whenever one of them had three neighbors, I collected it. But that assumes that you have access to every single valid location. In an unbounded grid, that's not doable because there's an infinite number of valid locations. And sure enough, there's not a method in the grid class that gives me all valid locations. There is a method in the grid class that gives me all non-empty locations. And that's surely a good starting point, right? I could go through all of the non-empty locations and ask, do you have three neighbors? you have three neighbors? you have three neighbors? And all of those who say yes, I collect them. The trouble is you could have a situation where that doesn't give you enough. 
So just consider in the game of life this configuration here. When I ask for what are all the non-empty locations, I'm going to get the locations of the three dots. But the location over here also has three neighbors. All right, so this one he has three neighbors, but it's not returned. Return, whatever, by non empty locations. Yeah? Well, I have no control over this as the implementer of homework 13C. I'm being given a grid. That full thing has four different methods. I have to be able to do the job with those four methods and nothing else. It doesn't matter if maybe there would be a clever way that the thing could tell me. It's not. It only implements those four methods. So given that I've solved the homework, there must be a way of doing it. So how do you, how do you uh, get to also enumerate those ones here? In this particular case, how many do I have with three neighbors? In fact, it's only these two, right? Everyone else has some other number of neighbors. Ah, OK. So I have to go through this one here. And I have to not just ask, do you have three neighbors? I also have to say, and what are your empty neighbors? Let me check those as well. And so that is what you really do have to do. You have to go for, through each of one. And now you check itself. And you also check its various neighbors. Now you go to this one here. And now notice that you check some of them twice. And that's OK in your logic if you happen to check them twice. Just make sure that they don't get in twice into the answer. So in your answer, somewhere, you have to check for duplicates. So you could first check whether you already had it and then measure how many neighbors it has. Or you could first measure how many neighbors it has and if it happens to have the right count, then you can check whether you've already reported it. Just make sure that in, this, in the list that you return to me that it's free of duplicates. But yes, you do have to, to combine those two methods. You have to first say, give me all of your non-empty locations. And then for every one of those locations, you have to say, Give me your neighbors as well. And that's all you have to check because if it's, what this gives you is it gives you all of the empty neighbors surrounding the non-empty locations. And if it's further away than that, like you're not going to get the one that I'm about to mark in blue. This one, you're not, you're not going to get this way. But that one's never going to be able to have one or more neighbors because it's completely surrounded by empty space. So you don't have to go out more than once, one level from the non-empty ones. Okay. Any questions about this subtlety? All right. 